All right, good evening. Thank you so much for coming out this evening. Uh, my name is Eric Austin. I'm the executive director of the Burton K. Wheeler Center. Um, this is a super exciting evening for us. I'm so grateful to see such a large crowd tonight. Um, we hear a lot these days about uh, sort of growing cynicism about politics in the United States and you know, perceptions about dysfunction sort of within and between or among American institutions of government. Um, one thing is very clear about the, the landscapes, the resources, the issues that Senator Tester and Secretary Jewell are going to be speaking about tonight is that these are, are issues that are not going to fall off the radar for lack of concern. These are landscapes that are not going to uh, wither because of, atrophy, or of, because of apathy, right? And the fact that so many of you have come out tonight um, to, to listen to and to be engaged in this conversation, I think speaks very well and gives us, I think, reason for enthusiasm about American politics. Um, and it is also very much at the core of the mission of the Wheeler Center. Um, Burton Wheeler, Senator Wheeler, was very much concerned about opportunities to engage the American people, to engage American citizens uh, in critical questions that are of concern to them. And obviously this is one of those issues or one of those areas of concern to, to many of you. So thank you again for coming out tonight. Um, Obviously, an event like this doesn't come off without a lot of help from a number of people. We don't have a ton of time tonight, but I do need to say a few thank yous before we get rolling. Um, first off, um, I need to acknowledge and say, uh, acknowledge a deep debt of gratitude to the secretary, to the senator, and to both of their staffs. Um, as you can imagine, it is a bit of a challenge to arrange schedules to, especially folks like this whose, whose time is in high demand, to join us for an event like this. We've been working on this event for several months now. Um, that the event would happen has never been in doubt. We've been working hard on when it was going to happen. Um, that it's come together tonight um, is really a testament to the commitment both of the secretary and the senator as well as to their staff. So to both of you and to your staffs, thank you so much for, for making this happen. Uh, I also need to acknowledge the ongoing partnership that the Wheeler Center has with the university. The university has been an integral supporter of the, the Wheeler Center really since its inception. And we would be unable to bring events like this um, to campus without their support, or really do we, almost any of the programming that we're involved in without the continued involvement and, and support of the university. And, and we're very grateful for that. Um, as you as you noticed, we've got a couple of cameras here in the room. Um, the, we knew that the demand for this event was, was going to be high. Um, we didn't anticipate quite how high that was going to be, which is fantastic. Unfortunately, what that means is that we haven't had as many tickets or haven't been able to provide tickets to everybody who wanted to be here tonight. Instead, what we are doing, however, is partnering with uh, Montana PBS and with Stephen Maley at TVMT to capture the audio and video of the event so that we can make it available to folks later who can't be here tonight. Um, and so we're grateful for that opportunity to work with Montana PBS, to work with Stephen, uh, to make that happen. Um, bringing high quality audio and video is not a free endeavor. Uh, and we are also benefiting from the generous support of AT&T, who is helping underwrite that. So I wanted to acknowledge that and say thank you to them as well. Um, there are a whole collection of other individuals who have been involved in bringing this together. Um, because of time, I'm, I'm not going to identify them individually, and it would start to sound a little bit like an um, Oscar Award recipient speech. <laughs> which I know none of you want to hear. Um, I do have one other announcement, though, that I need to make, and that is uh, about the next uh, or upcoming Wheeler Center activity or event, which will be a one-day conference on campaign finance, both here in Montana and around the country. Um, a few little oohs and ahs there. Um, Obviously, campaign finance, public discourse about campaign finance is one of those issues that, at least in public conversation, tends to generate a lot more heat than light. 
our intent is to try and reverse that a little bit with this conference. And so we've been uh, fortunate to bring together a collection of panelists, um, litigators, legislators, regulators, historians, political scientists, um, interest group members, and a wide diverse set of perspectives and roles who have um, extensive experience and familiarity with the tensions and the trade-offs associated with campaign finance. That event is going to be on April 11th in Helena at the Best Western Great Northern Hotel in Helena. There's information about that uh, event on our website. Um, we would love to have you attend, so please think about coming up to Helena to join us for that, uh, for that conference on April 11th. Um, so having said all of that, I am going to turn the microphone over now uh, to an individual who will be introducing or formally introducing our guest this evening. Um, I am very fortunate to work with this individual uh, who has been a big supporter of the Wheeler Center. Um, I'm able to work with her, or fortunate enough to work with her both as the director of the Wheeler Center, also as a faculty member here at the university. Um, and so on that note, I'm going to turn the microphone over to President of Montana State University, Dr. Wadad Cruzado. Thank you so much, Eric. What about a round of applause for our executive director? <laughs> Eric, I just need to say the Wheeler Center has always been characterized for having extraordinary executive directors. And, uh, Ever since you started, you have just added additional luster to that wonderful chain of extraordinary servants and leaders. So thank you so much. So good evening, everybody, and welcome to your university. Take a look at this audience tonight. And let me just remind you that this is Friday of spring break. And to see this wonderful audience here, a full house tonight of faculty members, students, staff, alums, community members, not only from uh, Bozeman and the Gallatin County, but from the entire state. It's just a great evidence about your interest and about your devotion to Montana State University. And I just want to say thank you so much for your support. Tonight, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you our two distinguished guests this evening and also our moderator. First of all, I would like to welcome back to MSU our friend Senator John Tester, senior United States Senator from Montana. As we know very well, John and his wife, Sharla, still farmed the land near the town of Big Sandy, Montana, that was homesteaded by John's grandparents in 1912. After earning a degree in music from the University of Great Falls, John took over the Tester Farm in 1978. He also taught music at Big Sandy's elementary school and eventually was elected to the Big Sandy School Board. John was elected to the Montana State Senate in 1998. In 2005, he was elected as Montana Senate President. He was elected to represent Montana in the US Senate in 2006 and re-elected in 2012. Senator Tester is known to be an advocate a strong advocate, I should add, for rural America, for small businesses, responsible energy development, sportsmen's issues, clean air and water, Indian nations, women's access to care, and quality health care for all of America's veterans. He serves on the Veterans Affairs, Homeland Security, Indian Affairs, Banking and Appropriations Committee. We are very fortunate to have Senator Tester and very lucky to have him with us tonight. Senator Tester, would you please stand up and be recognized? Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have, we have many reasons to say thank you. 
But um, among them, I want to say thank you so much for making possible the presence on our campus of our next guest, Secretary of the Interior, Sally Jewell. Sally Jewell was sworn in as the 51st Secretary of the Interior on April the 12th, 2013. Secretary Jewell leads an agency with more than 70,000 employees, and that is the steward for approximately 20% of the nation's lands, including national parks, national wildlife refuge, and other public lands. In Montana, the agency is responsible for more than 24 million acres. The Department of the Interior oversees the responsible development of conventional and renewable energy supplies on public lands and waters. It is the largest supplier and manager of water in the 17 Western states and it upholds trust responsibilities to the 566 federally recognized American Indian tribes and Alaska natives, including 12 in Montana and the island of Puerto Rico, I should add. <laughs> Prior to her confirmation, Secretary Jewell served in the private sector, most recently as president and chief executive officer of Recreation Equipment Inc. or very well known to us, REI. Secretary Jewell joined REI as Chief Operating Officer in 2000 and was named CEO in 2005. During her tenure, REI nearly tripled in business to a $2 billion enterprise and was consistently ranked one of the 100 best companies to work for by Fortune magazine. Before joining REI, Jewel spent 19 years as a commercial banker, first as an energy and natural resources expert, and later working with a diverse array of businesses. A graduate of the University of Washington, Secretary Jewel was trained as a petroleum engineer she started her career with Mobile Oil Com Corporation in the oil and gas fields of Oklahoma and the Exploration and Production Office in Denver, Colorado. An avid outdoors woman, Secretary Jewell finds time to ski, kayak, hike, and other outdoors activities. You are, Madam Secretary, in the right place today. We're delighted to have you with us. And to begin our conversation tonight, I would like to introduce Dr. Nicole Ray, our Dean of the MSU College of Arts and Architecture. In addition to being a skilled administrator who joined MSU more than a year ago, Dr. Ray is a respected and talented political scientist, the author of five books on American politics, Dr. Ray's research interests focus on American national poli political institutions, comparative political parties and party systems, European government and politics, and conservative politics. He holds a doctorate in politics from Oxford University and an undergraduate degree in politics from Edinburgh University. I think we are all in for a very informative session. Welcome to the podium, Dr. Ray. Thank you very much, uh, President Cruzado. Welcome, everybody. And um, I think we'll get straight down to the business of the evening. And I would like to ask our two distinguished guests, starting with Secretary Jewell, to share with us their view on the balance between uh, conservation and development. Very important issue here in Montana and in the Mountain West. Thank you. I think I'm gonna, is this on? Yes, I think I'm going to stand up because you can't see me otherwise, other than, unless you're in the front row. You might be able to see the senator. He's a little taller than I am. Um, first, it's a privilege and pleasure to be back in Montana and to be back in the West. My home is in Seattle. I miss it. 
you don't get to see much of home. Uh, so my new home is the other Washington, Washington, D.C. But whenever I'm out west and I drink up the scenery of the mountains and uh, the uh, warmth of the people, it gives me a shot in the arm to keep going. I got this beautiful necklace today from the Crow Tribe. We were out there a little earlier today. I thought I would uh, honor them and you by wearing it. Uh, they do beautiful, beautiful work. And uh, so we started our morning today with uh, eight uh, different tribes at the Montana-Wyoming Tribal Council. Um, we went out to the Crow Tribe to look at some water projects. And uh, we've just had a, a really good beginning to a, a three-day tour of Montana. So I can hardly wait for the rest of it. And it will take me to uh, one of the parts of Interior, which is uh, Glacier National Park, a little bit later for hopefully some snowshoeing with the senator and others. Um, so uh, I'll skip my opening remarks and go straight to the question. I do not uh, believe that uh, there is a compromise between economic growth and development and having uh, conservation and a healthy ecosystem. In fact, I would argue that they go hand in hand. Right uh, when we got to Bozeman, we sat down with business leaders from around Bozeman that talked about why they moved their businesses here. Some of them, outdoor businesses, Sims, for example, involved in fly fishing, but also uh, companies involved in baby diapers and in computer software and in economic analysis. In fact, the uh, firm involved in economic analysis is doing work for the Department of the Interior. Why are they here? They're here because of Montana's spectacular great outdoors. They're here because Montanans care about your landscapes and care about preserving these landscapes for future generations. Whether you are, as Senator Tester is, involved in working the land since 1912, organic farmer, brings his own beef to Montana because he's not sure what's in the stuff that we have back there. <laughs> I need some of that, by the way. <laughs> um, or, or whether you are uh, involved in outdoor recreation and tourism, like my colleague Dan Wank, who is the superintendent of Yellowstone National Park and uh, was in Washington, D.C., so he's seen both sides. And my colleagues that uh, may be here from the Bureau of Reclamation that are involved in water, but in, in uh, being involved in water, they're also creating re reservoirs which create uh, habitat for fish and also places for recreation. A place like Montana is attractive to businesses, and two uh, REI board members live here in Montana. We brought them on the board at the time because they represented different geographies, one New Jersey, the other Texas. Now we've got two board members from Bozeman, Montana. That doesn't look, <laughs> that doesn't look very good when you're trying to show diversity. So why did they both move here? And it's because of the incredible uh, community that this is and those mountains that you see every place you go and the critters that you share these lands with because you do care about conservation. I also want to give a shout out to the many people that have been involved in the Crown of the Continent work, recognizing that uh, migratory animals like bison or elk or grizzly bears and all of the critters that you don't think of because they're not charismatic megafauna, but they depend on an ecosystem that's all linked together, is not just cannot be done just in Yellowstone National Park or Glacier National Park, but needs to be done over a broader landscape. And you got that in Montana with the Crown of the Continent work. And you have many ranchers and uh, farmers that have come to, table, to the table as partners in conservation, saying, we want this lifestyle for future generations. And to help us afford, do that, we're going to sell, afford to do that, we're going to sell a conservation easement so that these lands will always be kept in conservation. It's that kind of landscape level understanding that we have to do around the country. And Montana is a model. So I'm going to end with just a, a quick summary of three uh, trends that we pay attention to every single day in the Department of the Interior. One is that we're operating in a time of constrained resources. There's never going to be enough money to go around for everything that we want. And so we have to be smart about how we use our money. You can't do more with less forever. At some point, you have to do less with less, so you have to decide what to do. And uh, so constrained resources are with us to stay. Second is we've got a massive generational transformation going on around this country. And because it's a Friday night and it's spring break, I don't see as many younger people in the audience as I know there are present in Bozeman when it's not spring break and it's not a Friday night. But uh, the reality is we have a generational transformation, very large baby boom generation, 76 million strong, a small Gen X component in between, and then a very large millennial generation, 79 million strong, and lots of young people coming up behind them. 
and yet in this time of constrained resources, in a time when these young people are more disconnected from nature and the outdoors than ever before, we need to make sure that they feel welcome in a place like Montana. They feel welcome in public lands. They represent the diversity of America, and uh, we train them to take on the jobs that many of us have now that uh, we're going to be eligible to retire from very quickly. So that's the second big trend. The third big trend, and you feel it in Montana, is climate change. Whether it's a couple degree difference that stops the pine beetle larva from dying uh, with the cold temperatures so that they de decimate your forests, or it is the invasive species like cheatgrass that are enabled by fire and cause a negative spiral around fire, or it's a drought we see in California or the polar vortex that we've heard about in this last winter with the wacky weather. Uh, things are changing, and uh, we need all hands on deck to be able to figure out how do we prepare our landscapes, how do we mitigate our landscapes, and how do we get smart about the things that we're doing that are adding to climate change. So those are three big trends that I think about every day in the work that we do. It's one of the reasons I took on this job, and I really look forward to your questions and uh, comments and learning more from you as I uh, tour around your great state of Montana. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Sen Senator Tester. I, I will be brief. First of all, I want to thank Waded for the kind introduction. Thank you very, very much. And I want to thank the Wheeler Center. Uh, this group has been around for uh, 25 years, talking about issues that are very, very important to Montana. Uh, this is one of those issues. Uh, when you brought up campaign finance reform a minute ago, uh, I just want to point out one thing to you. In 2012, $60 million was spent on this Senate race for 475,000 votes. You can take it from there, OK? Um, it is great to be here with, uh, with, with Secretary Jewell, um, somebody who has a, 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 an incredible gr gas, a gr a grasp of uh, what's going on in the West and the value of public lands. Um, as a policymaker, um, I think it's, it's very, very important that we have these kind of discussions so we can we can take uh, ideas that will come out of here tonight, I hope, back to uh, support things like the land and water conservation thing, support things like a farm bill that, that helps encourage conservation, support tax policies that help encourage conservation. Uh, the list goes on and on and on from a policy standpoint. But, but ultimately, in the end, if we're talking about uh, pitting one against another, development versus our treasure landscape, uh, We've got to be able to do both, and we've got to be able to do both smartly, and it can be done. Uh, I've said before, and I'll say it again, there are some places where development uh, would be a poor choice, Rocky Mountain Front being one. And there are other places where development makes perfect sense. So we've got to be smart as we move forward. And then, as we pulled out of, uh, out of Crow Country this morning, and we were driving down the road, uh, looking at the beautiful landscape, uh, I said to Sally, I said, you know, those of us that live in Montana take this for granted. The fact is, is there's very few places like we have here in Montana. And if we aren't proactive about how we deal with these treasured landscapes, they will be gone. And they will be gone quicker than if we use a measured approach and deal with it in a way that our kids will be proud of us. Uh, with that, um, we'll turn it back for, uh, for the discussion. Thank you very much. One very sensitive issue here in the Northern Rockies, which I think we'd be interested to hear your views on, is the listing or delisting of endangered species and the factors that you think should go into making those kinds of decisions. Madam Secretary? Keep standing up just so you can make eye contact. Um, so the Fish and Wildlife Service is uh, for the land-based side of, uh, of the United States, is the agency that is charged with administering the Endangered Species Act. It's an act that's been around for 40 years. It's been very, very important in bringing science to the table so we actually understand our ecosystems. We understand how things knit together, and we understand what's happening to the species in them. So uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service is exercising the law of the land in its administration of the Endangered Species Act, which says that we must understand uh, habitat, species, likelihood of survival, um, and take all of those things into account when we decide whether to list a species or when we decide whether to delist a species. Uh, 
this is probably one of the areas of greatest controversy within the Department of the Interior. But the uh, team that works on this, I would say in many ways, has to be dispassionate. They're using the best available science. They're using proven techniques of habitat uh, uh, management, restoration, and care on the ground as they make their decisions. And we've got uh, some, some very significant ones uh, that are in play here in Montana. So there was a proposal by the Fish and Wildlife Service to delist the gray wolf. And that is uh, getting further study from a scientific peer review panel. The gray wolf doesn't have to come back to its historic range, but it is, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service assesses whether that it is in danger of going extinct. And when they made the recommendation to delist, that was because they felt that the gray wolf had recovered, which is a success story of the Endangered Species Act, to the point where um, it was not in danger of going extinct. Another example on the other side is something that we are in the thick of right now with 11 western states, and that's called the greater sage grass. A highly uh, controversial uh, issue because there are many millions of acres involved across 11 states. But what is extraordinary is we have 11 states working closely together on sage grouse conservation plans to provide surety to the Fish and Wildlife Service with the hopes that a listing can be avoided. So that's how the Endangered Species Act works. Um, it is full of controversy, but it is backed by sound science. And uh, for the Fish and Wildlife Service colleagues, and uh, even for someone in my chair, emotions run high around the Endangered Species Act.